All right, Dave, so what were some of your main takeaways of the day? And I should mention that Jennifer, of course, it was invited and more than welcome. Again, her voice still it has not returned, so she will not be joining us for our wrap-up. I don't have to talk twice as long, though, do I? No, no, okay, no. Okay, all right, good. I think people would appreciate that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, these uh, conferences uh, are, are always enlightening, and, uh, and it's hard to roll up, uh, you know, all these panels because there's so much uh, rich discussion and... and um, and of course, so many more questions. Um, I like to collect quotes and, and uh, sound bites, and, uh, and some that really stuck out uh, with me. Uh, you know, I've heard some some really really important uh, important words. And I think um, one of the key points, though, for me is just how complex both China is domestically, and then of course our relationship. Uh, but one of our speakers mentioned that we really need to be humble in our analysis, and I think that's a very important. Uh, um, you know, we don't know everything that's happening. Uh, we don't know a lot of things that are happening. So I think we have to be humble as, uh, as we uh, uh, analyze the situation. Um, I think it's fascinating to, to hear the discussion about uh, the bureaucracy and the passive resistance. You know, we think, uh, or I tend to think of um, a, uh, a country like China uh, with the Chinese Communist Party being uh, you know, omnipresent and, uh, and in total control. Uh, but the amount of uh, uh, you know, feet dragging and implementation of policy, I think, is really, um, uh, you know, something that, that is, uh, is important to understand. Uh, the Chinese economy, the most difficult to read and, uh, and to understand what's going to happen uh, with the economy. Uh, I mean, of course, our economy is challenging enough, uh, but I think to try to understand the Chinese economy really takes a lot of, uh, a lot of work. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, the size of the, of the Chinese economy uh, obviously ha has global impact. Um, I thought it was interesting, and even in the last panel, talking about anti-corruption and uh, the um, the quote that has stuck with me: the anti-corruption campaign is leaving scars, or is going to leave scars for years. I think that's that's an important consideration as we uh, as we think ahead. Um, I really like the uh, the quote though that. Uh, U.S. politics are, are totally under uh, overreported, and Chinese politics is totally underreported, and I think that's a, that's quite a comparison uh, between um, uh, between both. And you know, and speaking of scars, I think that the point was was well made that uh, China is a, a wounded society or a wounded culture, and the, and the scars of the Cultural Revolution uh, still uh, persist today. Uh, and is is Xi really strong? Uh, I think the comments about the false veneer uh, and uh, hard on the outside, soft on the inside, I think that, that is uh, important to know, especially as we, um, you know, as was noted, um, it's a very Hobbesian situation uh, with very few rules uh, inside there. So uh, although, again, it was said that uh, Xi is breaking the, the system uh, just as Mao broke the system, and I wonder about the implications of that uh, for the future. Um, lastly, uh, as a uh, former military person there, uh, the comment about joining the army will cost you, that uh, really resonates. And uh, I just can't imagine having to, to pay for promotion. Uh, so those are some of the key things that... Uh, Besides with the beers that you usually have to buy a room. Well, to get yes, promoted. of course. That, that happens in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, for our students that are here, um, you know, the importance of these events uh, one is exposure to some of the leading scholars uh, in this area and, and uh, you know, seeing the people that really you need to follow uh, to know these issues. Uh, so the networking, the critical ideas, uh, and then most importantly, topics for research and writing. And uh, I could think of uh, many, many ideas for, uh, for future research uh, that has come from today. So I would, uh, I would uh, recommend you uh, you know, you look at your notes, especially when you uh, have, have papers due and research projects. So I, I think that, that really is the, the, uh, uh, some of the takeaways that I have. And you do that and then. 
Give well, some I guess, to your um, you know, educators think alike because one of the things that really stood out to me uh, is uh, a certain lack of consensus among our panelists about a number of extremely important issues. Uh, I was inspired to bring together experts on this topic because I wanted to know fundamentally whether dyna domestic dynamics were going to be a positive influence or a negative influence on Chinese external policies. But in the end, our panelists gave us a number of arguments for why, in some cases, it's positive, why, in some cases, it's negative, in some cases, it's neutral. So we had some examples um, when uh, Mel Melanie Hart spoke about climate change and how the people demanded um, that uh, things get cleaned up at home, and this has led to opening of cooperative efforts with the United States. Uh, the Chinese people have also demanded a voice when it comes to the protection of Chinese nationals overseas and how that has potentially uh, opened up a space for cooperation with the United States and other countries for engaging in um, military operations other than war, humanitarian aid, and assistance. Then there is also a lot of negatives of how potentially these factors could lead to more emotional or destabilizing responses that the party's hands somehow could be tied. And in our panel on elite politics, we talked much more about how it could be negative, not for the world, but that certain policies might be corroding the system itself. Um, and then how that's going to impact Chinese behaviors up in the air. Then we had a final position, which was kind of neutral, that China is on a path in terms of its foreign policy. And while we look at all these internal factors, they're not going to fundamentally change uh, Chinese foreign policy interests and how they pursue those, which led to a big question for me, which was what factors are actually causal? Uh, we spoke a lot about um, different domestic factors, about nationalism, about uh, demographics, about the PLA. And then we also speak about foreign policy, but where the opacity really impacts our analysis analysis is to be able to connect uh, clearly what's happened on the domestic level to the international level. In many cases, to me, it seems equally plausible that these uh, two dimensions are changing and varying sort of separately, but the level um, of interaction isn't there. And this is important, I think, to understand for U.S. policymakers. Why don't we do more work on the domestic dimensions of Chinese foreign policy? I think one, these are factors that we fundamentally cannot shape. Uh, and for policymakers, you want to understand factors that you can influence. And some of the domestic political aspects of Chinese policy are things that either we cannot influence or things that we would not want to influence given the political sensitivity of those issues and high risks associated with trying to influence China domestically, especially with this enhanced complexity. Which leads to my next point about how complicated this landscape is now. When I first started studying China um, myself, now about 15 years ago, there used to be, you know, there's an expert who knew about the party and maybe an expert who knew about the military um, and maybe, you know, a comparativist who those two experts ever talked to who knew something about what was going on internally. And now, as you can see from our panelists, to understand what motivates and drives the Chinese, you need to understand its main leaders, including Xi Jinping. You need to understand Xi's relationship with the party. You need to understand his relationship with the masses, the people's expectations of the party, and in all this context, how the strategic setting that China is operating in is changing drastically, and how that, that setting itself is expanding. China doesn't only think about itself um, domestically or in the region, but now China is trying to think about itself uh, in the world as a whole. So there seems to me to be a lot of very good research topics here, um, a lot of good things to pursue. It seems because now China is such a popular topic, there are many people who work on it, but at least in my view, the field is uh, not even close to being saturated. Mm -hmm. So I would strongly encourage uh, any of our students who are interested in these topics to continue to pursue them. And with that, I'll turn over for final concluding All right. Well, remarks. I, I First, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for, uh, for joining us today. I think that, uh, um, you know, we're here uh, because of uh, uh, everybody's uh, desire to, to understand uh, the complexity of, uh, of our relations here. And so we appreciate uh, everybody coming here because we, we put this on for you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, and I think everyone will agree that uh, uh, all of our scholar practitioners, uh, you know, brought keen insights and, uh, and important information uh, to, uh, uh, to help us to better understand what is, what is happening. 
Uh, I'd like to thank our great partners, the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Asia Division, uh, particularly uh, Jennifer Statz, who unfortunately is ill, but uh, uh, I have to say that she and Oriana together uh, have really chose the right speakers. Uh, the right, they were all complimentary, uh, you know, but with diverse views uh, that, that really made things uh, uh, extremely interesting for us. I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, at Georgetown Security Studies, Andrea Claybaugh, uh, for uh, and all of our students who uh, volunteer to be here uh, to uh, to help make this make this work, and, and lastly, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our benefactors uh, who make this possible, who are so supportive of our students and education, uh, the Philip and Patricia Building Fund uh, for the uh, the study of Asian security, uh, and they generously uh, resource these events uh, so that we can all learn uh, and uh, and understand the, the key Asian security issues. And I would just, you know, close uh, with thinking about the way ahead. You know, it seems to me there's there's three the three C's, and uh, is it cooperation, competition, or conflict? And uh, I think those are, you know, w which one of those is it going to be for the future? And I think that uh, the panels uh, today uh, really illustrated um, that uh, we don't know the way ahead, but we certainly need to work and uh, and hopefully. Hopefully it will be cooperation. I think it will likely be competition, and I hope that uh, it won't be conflict. So, so yeah. that will be the topic of next year's panel on that, uh, next year's conference. So on that note, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you next year.